Um, I know we have more people coming in. Um, Dr. Wolf, are you ready to go? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so I want to welcome Dr. Wolf to Grand Rapids Community <coughs> College, as well as the Brains Organization. My name is Melanie Shee, and I am a professor in the exercise science department. And the exercise science department, along with the exercises medicine team and the centers of teaching excellence here at Grand Rapids Community College have partnered together with Dr. Wolf and Brains to bring them onto our college campus um, so we can learn a little bit more about um, how ADHD is maybe impacting us as faculty and staff, but also our students um, in our classrooms. Um, Dr. Michael Wolf is a neuropsychologist and a co-owner of BRAINS. And the BRAINS mission is to maximize the potential of families through understanding the complex relationship between the brain, body, and real life. And Dr. Michael Wolf works with families, works with children, and helps them to um, learn how to navigate ADHD and, um, and work through these compli complications um, to help them reach their full potential. So Dr. Michael Wolf, welcome to Grand Rapids Community College, and we welcome the presentation of ADHD Goes to College. You're on, sir. I appreciate that. Thank you for the invitation to uh, join you guys today <clears throat> and then also share this with others who uh, may want to watch uh, it later. <clears throat> I'm going to hopefully get through this um, fairly well here. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and then I will be able to let you guys see the presentation. I won't be able to see comments <clears throat> is my understanding once uh, I share the screen here. Um, so if there are comments, I will try to check those uh, either as we go or towards the end. And so <clears throat> I apologize for that, but I want to make sure that uh, you guys can see what I'm seeing as we kind of go through the presentation as well. <clears throat> so let me get this into presentation mode. There we go. <clears throat> or if you just have a, a question, feel free to certainly interrupt it too. <clears throat> so my agenda today, just a brief review. Most of you are going to be very familiar with ADHD and what it is. Uh, we're going to glance at some prevalence rates. Um, those are important to understand, especially when we think about the idea of ADHD going to college and just in adults in general. <clears throat> what does it look like in the brain? Um, why sometimes, or is it possible, but also why are we not always catching ADHD before they hit the college environment? And sometimes, especially those of you who are faculty and working with individuals, um, they might not have a pre-existing diagnosis, um, but they uh, start struggling in your classes and you're trying to figure out what's going on. And uh, you guys might be the first ones to sometimes pose, you know, is this ADHD? <clears throat> and if so, what do we do with it? And then the bigger question is more the now what? Um, so whether it is and or and is not ADHD, how do we move forward in that progression of helping these individuals uh, as adults and obviously in college uh, to be as successful as they can possibly be? <clears throat> so hopefully these videos work as well. They're, we, we got to play these things. We're not hearing the audio from the video. Oh, did someone have a comment there? Yeah, there's no audio. Oh, it's playing loud on my side. Yeah, the video is choppy and there's no audio. Oh man, you guys are missing an awesome video there. 
All right, I will skip the video. It's, it's playing audio loudly on my side. I don't know exactly why it's not playing on your guys' side because I have the audio cranked. Okay, <clears throat> I'll skip the video then. I should send you guys a link for it because it's an amazing video. Um, I'm biased because it's, oops, that's not what I want to do. I need to go on to the next slide here. So we'll get down with ADD at another point in time, because uh, that's essentially, it was a rap song there about ADD and, and showing you guys some of the uh, experience of what it might be like to uh, have someone with ADD uh, and how they get distracted more as adults, more so than what we see with uh, pediatrics. Um, so I apologize that the audio didn't work. We, I have one or two other embedded videos um, and I'm guessing the audio might not work on those on your end either um, for some reason. So I, I guess we'll miss all of those. <clears throat> But when we look at ADHD then from a diagnostic point of view, the most important thing to remember <clears throat> is it has to be a continuous pattern um, of an ongoing either significant inattention and or hyperactivity or impulsivity. So it's not a, a, a waxing and waiting pattern where we might have it, you know, a couple of days a month that we're struggling or, you know, if we have a migraine and that's causing a problem for us for a couple of days or, or maybe a week, um, it has to be a continuous pattern. <clears throat> and then we're looking at uh, distractibility, moving from task to task, being restless, um, lacking organization, daydreaming. Uh, procrastination is one of the bigger ones in college uh, that seems to cause problems for a lot of our individuals um, in that uh, they don't know how to really structure uh, when my assignments are due, when are my papers due, when am I taking my tests, um, and how to lay out that process. So they always seem to be behind the eight ball uh, in the college milieu. It can happen with us professionally, and it can obviously happen with us in jobs as well. Um, but it seems to stand out a little bit more for a lot of these individuals as they go from high school, where things were maybe a little bit more structured, and uh, teachers and parents and stuff were working diligently with the individuals. But when we move into those first phases of independent life, where we might be away from home on a campus or um, doing things uh, on our own and not wanting uh, people looking after us, that we start to notice that difficulty all of a sudden being more influential. Again, most of you are gonna be very um, familiar with those concepts. When we look at what the three types of ADHD are, and unfortunately I had a great clip from Madagascar for you guys too, <clears throat> but uh, you know that's the kids that usually get caught pretty early and you'll see that in another slide too. Um, but I call those our Tigger kids. Um, they're moving, they're wiggling, they're shaking, they're restless, their uh, legs are bouncing, they're tapping their pencil. Um, they stand out visibly to the average person. And so you can see uh, what's going on with those individuals. And they're disruptive in some way, shape, or form to what is happening, whether it's in the lecture, whether it's working with them uh, in student consultation uh, in the research lab. These are the individuals that might have fun with gas and Bunsen burners. Um, and they seem to um, enjoy that type of activity, but they're not always fully in control of it. So they're not doing it on purpose, per se. Then we have the daydreamy type, um, and that's where I got poo there. Um, the more inattentive. These individuals are the ones that are more often not um, readily identified, particularly high school or below. They might not stand out. They're still able to get good enough grades because they're working on their homework um, through the process. And as a result of being able to compensate by taking more time to get their homework done in the evening, their grades are not something that would stand out to the school to say, huh, Maybe we should look at this as an evaluation option. Uh, parents, a lot of times, are not going to um, notice as much either because, again, they're, they're getting by. And so it's more the inattentive type that more often than not does have the tendency to get missed prior to college. Or it's on a weekly basis here that we'll see adult individuals, too, who are finally getting into their jobs. So they graduated college. Now they're kind of into that routine aspect of their life, and all of a sudden they can't keep their job or you know, they're getting written up or someone's giving them feedback, like, you know, you've really got to get these tasks done. Um, and they just can't seem to do it despite their best effort and interest in doing so. So they kind of get stuck in that think, 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 distraction, what's going on. Um, and they miss uh, some of the details they're in. And of course, then we have the combined type. And that's where we have that mix of both the hyperactive impulsive tendency and the inattentive quality. Now, most people, when they think about ADHD, you think, well, if you're hyperactive and, and impulsive, how can't you also have inattention? Uh, and it is amazing with the abilities of the brain and, and what we see in some of these individuals. 
where you can in fact have that person who's looking around and bouncing and they're all over the place. But then you're like, you're not even listening to me. And the next thing you know, they pipe right back to you and, and they repeat everything you just said. So they're in fact hearing you, but they can't control that physiological movement and restlessness that we see in them. They still might try to go from one thing to the next. They still might be looking around the room, looking for some sort of visual stimuli or something to that effect, but they're also able to attend uh, incredibly well uh, to what you might be saying or teaching them at that same time. We're seeing that type become a little bit more prevalent, um, the hyperactive impulsive type um, in our schools, because we have a lot of individuals more and more over the last decade that have become uh, engaged in excessive video game playing time and uh, they get that stimulation from the video games. And then when they go to the classroom, it's not as stimulating. Um, and so they, they do get that restless kind of that jonesing quality. Um, and therein, um, we see them being uh, kind of hyperactive or impulsive. But at the same time, they're used to listening when they're you know playing their games, whether it's because they're chatting with uh, friends that they're playing with, or if they're waiting for their parents to maybe uh, call them and they know, well, if I'm not attentive to my parents, um, then I have to turn the gaming system off. So they've picked up enough of that kind of blended skill uh, to still follow along with what's happening in the environment around them while also still needing a lot more activity. Now, the argument um, by what we're seeing in the World Health Organization is, you know, if they do have a video gaming type of addiction or a video gaming um, pattern, are they truly ADHD? with that hyperactive impulsive type when the world seems to be so slow for them in comparison to what they might typically be engaged in when they're doing video games. So the World Health Organization did add uh, the video gaming addiction or the excess video game playing um, as a means to say, well, this might be our bigger issue and it may not truly be ADHD. We need to work with the video game side, get them back into a pattern where the world can't be as uh, stimulating as that might be and then see what those symptoms might look like. Um, but it is challenging to uh, remove some kiddos from that ADHD-like pattern. Um, and we are seeing that more and more. It, it was common when I was in college back with uh, TVs had just come out. Um, but we're seeing that obviously more uh, even now and in today's um, world. So those are the major types that we're going to be um, dealing with in the three uh, subtypes of ADHD. Oh. Let's go on to the next slide here. <clears throat> The prevalence rates is kind of interesting. So when we look at worldwide, about 2.8% of the population is going to have uh, meet diagnostic criteria for ADHD. More often than not, ADHD is in fact diagnosed in childhood. So a majority um, are going to be diagnosed kind of in that mostly 6 to 17 or 18 range. That said, it's been an interesting progression in the last about five years or so. Uh, Prior to that, I would never have seen a two to three year old in my office already started on a psychostimulant medication. Uh, in my opinion, uh, that shouldn't be done and that's uh, too early to both make a, a formal diagnosis depending on what uh, is occurring in this individual's life and uh, obviously starting a medication that can alter sleep and, and eating habits uh, very robustly is also very concerning to me. Um, but we'll probably see about 10 to 15 children in here a year under four years of age that have already been started on psychostimulant medications. Um, but the six to 18 is really where it starts to happen. Once they get into you know, kindergarten, but realistically first grade, they're really starting to stand out. They're not performing as effectively uh, and they get noticed. That said, that still leaves a portion of the population that are not identified until their adult years. Now in adulthood, the numbers change a little bit where they're suggesting you know, 2.5 to maybe 4%, some say as high as uh, five, um, are in fact gonna be diagnosed with ADHD as adults. Um, now it makes some sense because we're gonna have those pediatrics that are gonna move forward and uh, continue with their ADHD diagnoses. And then we're gonna have unidentified uh, college students and adults who hadn't been diagnosed as of yet. Um, in looking at the process of uh, the statistics and how they manage those, it is a little bit interesting too, in that they say, the research suggests that about 50% of pediatrics that are originally diagnosed with ADHD in childhood 18 or younger, no longer meet criteria by the time they're adults, which then statistically would suggest that actually about 2.5 to 4% of uh, adults 
are being diagnosed for the first time at that point because we wash at least one to 2% of the early diagnosed individuals off the statistical books. Some consider the new diagnoses just when someone turns 18 in the research, other research models, if you uh, no longer qualify, it's only then if you're diagnosed newly as an adult for how they blend those statistics together. So there's a little bit of variation, but the overall population uh, trend does stay, uh, stay the same. Adults, males are particularly uh, at higher risk. Uh, we stand out a little bit more as males. We tend to be more hyperactive or impulsive more than the daydreamy type. Uh, women are slightly lower in their prevalence rates. Um, that said, women do tend to have more of the inattentive quality uh, or at least know how to manage themselves in an environment um, where they need to attend, where they might not stand out as much as the males uh, do. And then there's this other interesting study from JAMA, the Journal of, uh, from the Medical Association, um, that roughly looking at the last several years, there's been an increase in diagnoses in pediatrics of roughly 26.4%. But the increased diagnostic prevalency of adult diagnoses onset increased 123%. And so uh, that's an astronomical growth in terms of uh, adults being diagnosed for the first time with ADHD or ADD. Um, although that said, I'm using old vernacular. It's all ADHD now, and then you specify the subtype, uh, hyperactive type, uh, inattentive type, or combining type. Um, the reasons for that being in pediatrics and why we're seeing a growth in pediatrics, uh, our educational environments now have um, limited or possibly eliminated altogether uh, a lot of the activities that used to allow movement throughout the day. Uh, there used to be two recess intervals. There used to be a more movement through music classes and physical education. Now PE might only be uh, once or twice a week. Um, kids sometimes don't have any access to music programming. Uh, again, recess is usually once actually paired with and around the time of lunch. So they get really no movement break or, or check out in the morning. Then they have this one interval. Um, and sometimes for schools, if they're starting at seven or 7.30, that happens around 10 or uh, 11 o'clock. Uh, and then they got to make it through the rest of the afternoon without break again. For adults, uh, a lot of our jobs are becoming more animated. So it's sitting in front of uh, computers, watching teleprompters, obviously with the pandemic, um, being on Zoom uh, calls. Um, now that's escalated obviously in this last year, but even prior to that, um, there's a lot more automated types of jobs and it's harder for individuals who have ADHD to engage in uh, you know, paying attention to the details and the numbers and, and what's going on uh, in more of a docile position in comparison to when they may have been more physically active in their workplace environments. We're also seeing um, increases in expectation for responsibility in the world. Uh, so you might work longer, you might have uh, more things to do, you're being more involved on boards. Um, and so some of the adult dynamics have changed in such a way that that prevalence rate is, uh, rate is also increasing uh, very appreciably, much faster than it is in terms of pediatric diagnoses. So you are going to see more and more of these kids coming into the college environment, uh, more of your colleagues, and obviously just adults in general, especially those coming back to college who may not have been successful initially, now are coming back into the college environment. And um, trying to still get through what they couldn't complete originally. Um, and, and that might well be because they uh, had a diagnosis now of ADHD. Um, why is this a big deal? Um, and there's a lot of things that come along with this, but impaired quality of life. Um, now, so far, and this is just a, a little bone to pick, but a lot of insurance companies will not cover therapy if ADHD is your primary diagnosis because they're thinking, just get on a psychostimulant medication, you know, for roughly 95% of individuals, that medication is all you need. And, you know, we're going to be able to move forward with this. Um, that said, individuals, even when they are medicated, um, they do face other difficulties. Um, it's more difficult for them to maintain employment. Um, they, they tend to go through a much greater number of jobs. Um, they tend to experience more difficulties in relational breakups and not feeling successful in developing sustained relationships, tend to be more superficial tend to get uh, this reputation of being kind of a haphazard person that you're fun to be with, but do I really want to spend that much time with you? And then the mood disorders are one of our big concerns. Um, there is, you know, depending on the literature that you read, but at least a twice, if not higher 
um, time prevalence rates of suicidal ideation and or suicide in ADHD individuals. Um, they also, you know, don't like having to do things differently or being called out a little bit more or constantly be that daydreaming individual. Um, and it takes its toll on them as well. Now, usually we get a little bit of a sneak peek on what's going on with them symptomatically because they usually don't go from ADHD, you know, doing okay with medication, struggling to suicide. Usually they start to develop anxiety, depression, or something else in the middle that gives us a sense of like, oh, well, okay, you are sitting longer, but obviously there's something more going on and you're not managing this ADHD very well. And they'll get a secondary diagnosis that will come into play. We'll also see addiction rates increasing for alcohol, but in particular, stimulant-based um, drugs tend to be quite high. So our methamphetamines, our MDMA, our E, um, crushing and inappropriately using psychostimulants to get more of that high. Um, and in some cases, we also see Xanax uh, for some of our ADHD individuals who just want to kind of chill out a little bit. And so that said, there's a lot of things going on with them. There's a higher propensity, and we'll see this on another slide too, of uh, premature death from accidents. Now, that's not just auto accidents. That's a point I'll make in a coming slide. Um, but it's all our accidents because they do tend to be more of a risk-taking type of population uh, if they're on that more hyperactive, impulsive edge to what's going on with them. Graduation rates. Um, I think when I was doing this research, it, it was actually incredibly surprising to me. Um, so the way they've engaged this research is, you know, roughly about 33 to 36% of the average uh, individual in the United States is going to graduate with their bachelor's degree um, within four years. Um, to me that, you know, just, it, it, it seems shocking. I thought it'd be higher than that. Um, but they're just considering that, that statistic within four years. Many more, as much as 72 to 90% graduate at the fifth year or maybe the sixth year. So they need a, a prolonged window of time. And that's very true with our individuals with ADHD too. But when we look at the four year window mark of individuals who are diagnosed with ADHD, who try to go through it at the, on their own and try to get through this uh, graduation rate, it's a 5% graduation rate on time for those with ADHD in comparison to an average of about 35% of non-ADHD individuals are gonna graduate on time and in the uh, typical flow of what we'd expect uh, for graduating, whether from public colleges or universities. Um, now, the data that was just put out by uh, CAPEX um, in 2021 here, so some newer studies suggest that in the years prior to 2021, it's averaging to about 33.3% now for the average individual who's not ADHD. But uh, that said, that's a huge change in, in ability, which means more costs to them, more persistence getting through it, may even change degrees a little bit more frequently. Um, and then we're gonna see that difficulty where it's like, do I have the motivation to persist? Um, am I getting the support I need from, you know, my family, my friends, uh, my own motivation, my college? Um, to be able to, to be diligent to actually complete this graduation rate. Um, we've already talked about the unemployment, the changing jobs, the lower work performance. That last point there with the lower work performance, that also means that they're not as likely to advance into uh, supervisory positions or managers or just an income status. And so they do have that increased risk of having uh, a lower income level as well. Um, but then there's the ones that doesn't always make the media and we don't want to talk about because they're not fun. But teens and young adults in particular uh, who have been diagnosed with ADHD, this isn't specified by type, this is just as a generality, tend to have a much higher incidence rate of uh, teen pregnancy and young adult pregnancy, which is concerning because remember holding those jobs, getting the pay that you might need, and now starting a family early is a significant stressor. The individual, the parent who has been diagnosed with ADHD is much more likely to lose custody of their children. Um, and when it goes to court, uh, you know, the, the court's gonna look at who's providing the stability and who's providing the structure and getting the kids through what they need to. And lots of times the parent uh, who either has been diagnosed or maybe isn't diagnosed as of yet, uh, tends to be the less structured, the more fun. Um, but courts usually yield in the favor of the one that uh, is gonna provide what the, the child needs in order to be successful. High risk of uh, sexually transmitted diseases, um, going through a, a, and having more sexual partners. Um, and then our rates of uh, motor vehicle accidents also escalate uh, quite appreciably, um, which I, I kind of chuckle when I threw that one on the slide. 
because last week I had met a, uh, an individual out in the parking lot uh, at nine o'clock uh, after he'd just gotten done with this therapy session. And, and I happen to know this individual. And I'm like, you know, you've been taking your meds? And he's like, no, but ADHD people are better drivers. And I kind of giggle and I'm like, you, you realize that that's not true, right? He's like, are you kidding? He goes, I can drive faster and stop faster than anybody else in my family. And I'm like, well, I don't know if your family's going to be really happy to hear you're driving faster because that means you're at risk of getting more tickets. But I said, in the winter, if you're driving faster, doesn't that increase your risk of having minor accidents? He goes, not if you know how to manage yourself with a controlled skid. I'm like, all right, good point. But you also just proved my point too. Uh, this kid liked to drive and have fun because he would spin out and he would do the donuts and uh, things. He luckily had not been in an accident yet. So his perception of that was like, nah, I'm good. I'm a better driver because I do these things rather than realizing you're engaging in risky behavior that could increase your susceptibility to in fact having an accident. Um, so we will see those um, things coming into motion. Now when we look at the brain and, and what's going on with our uh, ADHD like brain, now, historically, and you'll see a slide on this too, uh, historically, we looked at um, neurological density and we knew that the National Institute of um, Mental Health, and I want to say it was 2007, um, imaged uh, a couple thousand individuals, those without ADHD and those with ADHD. And what they realized very early was the cortical density packing had changed. Newer research has tried to add additional specificity to going, okay, well, is it truly a, a broad neurological influence um, or does it really hit regional centers of the brain in terms of functional capacity different than it would others? Um, this has really come into the debate in terms of diagnostics because a lot of people say, well, ADHD can't be a disorder because it's not attributable to one thing. It's not one definable aspect of the brain. It's not one specific neurotransmitter. And as a result of that, it's more of an attention deficit that has multifaceted components to it, but maybe we need to pay more attention to the components than the broader diagnostic cluster overall. And so we are gonna see, um, there are in fact more and more regional structures that do tend to be more important um, than others. So yes, it's global cortical density, particularly in the frontal margin um, and through the temporal margins too, but we're also seeing some subcortical influence as well. Let me quickly check in here. I see we have some chats that had come up. Um, we're gonna, uh, yeah, you will. So I will uh, share the slideshow um, with uh, Melanie um, and Delaney can get that as well as being able to um, share the video from today's presentation too. So I will go ahead and send that, especially you guys have to watch those videos. Um, they're just too good not to. Um, but looking at this, <clears throat> We are seeing the amygdala, which is a really important center of the brain. Uh, the amygdala, it's a small little almond shape uh, aspect in the anterior temporal margin. Um, it's really important um, for our emotional regulation as well as our motivation to stick with things. Um, it can also lead to volatility emotionally. And I know one of the common symptoms we hear, at least for adults, uh, is from their partners, especially if they've been married and are thinking about divorces, man, they seem to fly off the handle really quickly. And they you know, just seem to overreact all the time. In all likelihood, that's because of the red nucleus in the amygdala, uh, which is causing an overreaction uh, in terms of what's happening to these individuals. So they do kind of go from zero to 100 pretty quickly. Um, and the vernacular there has changed too as cars gotten faster. It used to be going zero to 60, uh, but I understand now that the new vernacular is zero to 100 because cars go faster uh, more quickly as well. But then also that motivation. Yeah, I'll get to it. Yeah, I'll fix it. Yeah, that's not a big deal. Um, yeah, we're going to have supper at this time. But we really don't jump into gear to figure out, like, when am I supposed to engage this activity? And as a result, it can cause problems. We also see the hippocampal margin being um, influenced and usually smaller, uh, less active hippocampal regions. This is important because the hippocampus is believed to be one of those regions of the brain that stores a little bit of memory. But in reality, it works directly with the frontal lobe to prioritize what is important in learning and what should I be paying attention to? How should I be taking this in? Um, and so it's that prioritization of knowledge to say, yeah, I should be paying attention to um, this learning or this job or this uh, computer tech training thing that's going on instead of paying attention to what am I going to do after work? Or uh, the last time I had taught at GVSU, uh, I had a kid in the back of my physio class and here we are learning neuroanatomy 
And he's online gaming, hoping to get himself into a World Series of Poker tournament. And, you know, he and I had a talk after his parents called me and they, they were kind of upset with me that he was failing the class. And I told them, well, you know, he's choosing to pay attention to World of Poker more than neuroanatomy. And, and their first thing that they said to me is like, yeah, but he, did he tell you about his strategy and all he knows about uh, how to do Texas Hold'em? And I'm like, you know, he didn't. I, I, I didn't see that relevant to the class, to be honest. And they're like, oh, he's got a great memory for that. And I'm like, well, it, it's too bad that he's not necessarily playing world um, tournament of neuroanatomy because then he might have just as much success in my class. Um, but they, they don't learn what they're supposed to because they find more engagement in learning other things that might be more engaging for them. And then the hippocampus is also involved in the limbic system uh, in terms of emotional regulation. Then we have our caudate and our uh, putamen. These are really neat structures. Uh, they're part of the basal ganglia structures. They're part of the motor movement uh, system in the brain. Um, but they also have limbic functions uh, to them as well, especially the caudate, um, because it runs right under the cingulum, the anterior cingulum, but it really tracks the cingulum all the way back. And so this plays a role in some motivation. It plays a role in physical activity. And so our moving, our, our wiggling around, our looking for different things, our ability to hone in our attention to some extent on a target uh, that we wanna pay attention to. So if I'm reaching for my glass, like I could reach for my bottle right now, um, I wanna do that accurately without bumping it over and all of a sudden spilling something accidentally or without missing and glancing offside. Now it's teetering side to side. Everyone's like, oh, you see that big reaction coming at you like this is gonna tip. Um, but it's that clumsiness and that motor activity that are gonna come into uh, the caudate and the putamen um, in the influence of ADHD. And all these structures tend to be less active and potentially underdeveloped or immature in this world. But then when we move to the putamen, we're also gonna see the corpus striatum um, be influenced. Now the striatum is a very long pathway in the brain um, that uh, kind of regionally connects uh, our occipital margins with our frontal margins and then our streaming of action. So instead of taking snapshots, which might happen from the occipital temporal margin, uh, to be able to uh, pay attention to what is this particular word or what is it, this specific thing I'm looking at. The uh, corpus striatum or the striatal margin is one that keeps us streaming in life. So where am I at in space and time? So I don't run into that jaw jam or I don't get too close to that person or I don't interrupt. Uh, and it's that streaming that we need to have happen. And so we're gonna see that through that margin. And then the nucleus accumbens, which many of you are gonna be more familiar with when we talk about addiction potential. Uh, with alcohol and illicit drug use, the nucleus accumbens really lights up and has a strong dopaminergic activity. And I'm pretty sure that most of you here on the presentation day have realized, well, okay, dopamine somehow implicated um, in the neuroanatomical functioning of ADHD. And it is. It, it, I'll have a little shocker slide coming up here in just a second. Um, just a subtle one, not a big one. Um, but we know that dopamine's there. And so that means these individuals are more likely to seek that adrenaline, seek that risk taking and to be a part of what's going on. When we look at these, oops. You know, I gotta get my presentation moving. When we look at other fiber bundles that are important, we're gonna see that the superior temporal margin, especially the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which moves us from Wernicke's and some of the areas where math and reading disorders tend to be more specifically residing in, moves forward into Broca's to say, what am I understanding? What do I say in response? And how do I say that response to plan my auditory feedback loop? So I'm knowing like, okay, I, I'm hearing and I'm processing what I'm saying simultaneously to make sure that I'm saying the right thing and not having inappropriate things come out of my mouth. And that inappropriate stuff, that disinhibition stuff is really important in both the orbital frontal and the ventral aspect of the frontal lobe. And so the frontal basilar portion of the frontal lobe does also tend to show that immaturity. So we're seeing a lot of cortical influence coming through with ADHD. More often than not, it's both immaturity and maybe some less developed aspects, um, but they have significant fun functional implications as we work through those. As we look at it here, um, we're gonna see the superior longitudinal fasciculi, which is gonna overwrap um, and track that long pathway for us um, that connects the posterior to the frontal aspects from language processing, understanding what's being said, making sure I'm saying the right thing to the Broca's margin to make sure I'm communicating as effectively as I should be. Um, we're also gonna see other things like the nucleus accumbens, the head of the caudate, um, which the head of the caudate is gonna sit here, 
but the cingulum for a lot of our emotional regulation, especially the anterior cingulum, sits right above that, and those two communicate with each other quite often. Um, so that cingulate uh, is going to also flow into the margin of our ADHD and why we see some emotional dysregulation. And of course, our hippocampus and the rhinal cortex also come into those too. So that whole region and whole pathway from front to back tends to be implicated. Now, this is a study from 2007. So it's a little bit dated, but the research hasn't really changed. And so they haven't had to publish new statistics. So what you're going to be seeing is over here, we have the individual who's ADHD. And we're going to look at the cortical density in comparison to age match healthy samples that haven't been diagnosed with other concerns. And even here, sitting at nine years of age, we can easily see that the overall cortical density through the neocortex, the outer structure of the brain, is already much more densely packed at nine than what they had typically imaged for the individual who has ADHD. And so we see more definition throughout the whole frontal margin of the healthy versus the ADHD individual. We're seeing more visual motor planning and density through the striatal, which will eventually be that runs deep in the brain. But that whole pathway taking what am I from neocortex to relay that to the frontal margin isn't nearly as well developed at nine as it should be. Now, this one doesn't have sound, so it's not supposed to uh, play. It's just going to give you a schematic. You'll see the ages as it changes up here at the top, and then you'll just see the difference between the brains as they evolve through this process. And it's just a demonstration of the cortical density and how that overfolds uh, through the years. <clears throat> So even, and I know it ended there uh, pretty quickly, but even at 16 years of age, that ADHD brain has still not caught up and I'll try to get it over here. Ah, and I didn't pause it fast enough. Bum, 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 bum. We'll hit here and then we're just gonna hit pause. So even when we're looking at it at the late stages of 15, this brain is pretty darn mature for the most part. Now it will still advance in wisdom as we go through our life cycle. But in comparison, even at 15, we're still seeing uh, significant less cortical density uh, occurring through the non ad or through the ADHD sample in comparison to the non ADHD sample. Then we're looking at neurotransmission. Now, most of our medications that are used to treat ADHD are psychostimulants. Most of them tend to target dopamine. Um, and so, when we're looking at Ritalin, Concerta, Vyvanse, Stratera, not Stratera, that's a different one, um, Vyvanse. Um, methylphenidates, um, metadate, um, quillenda, all these ones really work within the dopaminergic, dopaminergic system because it seems to be the fastest way to get from non-responsiveness to responsiveness. Now, typically psychostimulants tend to work the best or the most effectively um, when it comes down to um, hyperactive or impulsive qualities. The newer research suggests that the psychostimulants don't always have the most or the best influence coming through in terms of inattention or that inability to maintain general focus. So that's a bit of a difficulty. But when we look at the broader sense of the literature and the research that comes into this motion, we're actually gonna see that norepinephrine seems to be the precursor neurotransmitter that seems to be not sufficient enough uh, in the synaptic cleft in a way that is gonna permit our brain to uh, function as well in terms of attentional monitoring and regulation. We're going to see it partly as a result of not releasing enough of the neurotransmitter. So we're not getting the overall production that we would like to see. Because we don't then have as much being released from the uh, synap into the synaptic cleft through the vesicles, there's not enough to be absorbed on the other side in comparison to other uh, neurotransmitters and um, chemical relay messengers that can be reabsorbed to continue that relay of chemical messaging through the uh, neurological system. And then also we see faster reuptake of the noradrenergic um, molecules. And as a result, then we're not getting that production coming back into the motion. We also know that norepinephrine is a building block for dopa. Dopa is needed to move into dopaminergic um, activity. So what most of our medications have found is, hey, look, instead of working on the norepinephrine, let's just go right to where we want to hit the target, dopamine. We know that dopamine is the activating chemical so let's not waste our time with norepinephrine. Let's just jump ahead and try to supplant the dopaminergic activity, which is fine um, to some extent. But we do know that there's increased risk of some agitation and obviously appetite suppression and 
increased risk of difficulties getting to sleep. And there can be some other side effects when we jump right to dopaminergic activity. Um, but what would they have found, like Sertera is the one that commonly gets discussed, the noradrenergic medication doesn't seem to be as potent and doesn't seem to give us as strong of an influence in the ADHD cycle. And as a result, skip that, move right into the dopamine. And if that's not working, then we can maybe look at other models of trying to treat this from a pharmacological point of view. And so that's why we typically see the dopaminergics coming into motion before we see other types of treatment systems. Diagnostic factors that we gotta be attentive here to. Most again are gonna onset in childhood. Now there is some really good research that's come out uh, and at least since 2010. Children who tend to be younger in their classes, so if you're kind of that young five versus the kid who's a little bit older in your class, those kids do tend to be um, diagnosed at a much higher rate than individuals who are not. We know, and I said it earlier, inattention seems to not be diagnosed until college or adulthood or in the workforce because you're not causing a problem. And because you're able to do a lot of your work outside the classroom, as long as you have that motivation enough to be diligent, you're still getting your grades from your work assignments or you know homework or take home quizzes, that your grade's still doing good enough. And it usually might be later once you get into late phases of junior, senior year or grad school, or of course, workplace environment that it seems to be noticed. It's amazing to me how many normal to high or superior intellectual functioning individuals uh, tend to not be diagnosed. They're so smart that even though they're not paying attention or even though they might be a little bit of a tigger or being a little bit disruptive, they're still able to understand everything because they don't need the repetition. They don't need the organization. They just seem to get it. I hear it. I get it. I'm good. But that can catch up with us later when things become more complex. And so we do see individuals in the average to uh, above intellectual ability, usually being diagnosed later, questioning the diagnoses later. And then we end up with a little bit of a double-edged sword because now through their formative years where we'd like them to learn study skills and we'd like them to learn persistence and like them to learn checking in, they were able to take that for granted, which means they didn't learn those skills but they maybe had kind of that sleeper ADHD kind of quality. It wasn't severe by any means at all, but it was there. And now when they get to college, it's like, whoa, okay. So even if I take my psychostimulant medication, it is helping, but I still don't know how to study. I don't know how to organize, organize my thoughts into a paper. I still don't know how to ask for help. I still don't, I don't know how to use what most people are thinking. Well, aren't you lucky that you could just take everything for granted? So now we got to teach them foundational skills at the same time that we have to potentially start a medication trial, at the same time, they're trying to keep up so that they don't fail out or don't miss a class or um, don't start to get beat up in the college environment where they're feeling like maybe they're not as capable and so they drop out. Maybe college is not for me. Um, and so it's a double target that we got to work on with those individuals. Um, and then this is uh, just one of the points, risk factors for misdiagnoses. Um, the younger they are in their class, prematurity, cognitive deficits, family dynamics, stress has a lot to do with attention and just hyperactivity um, for both adults and children. Any medical conditions, sleep disorders, um, headaches, migraines, uh, excess asthma, where they're taking a lot of medication uh, for managing those conditions can cause uh, alterations that will mimic ADHD very well. Um, learning disabilities, and it was way back in the day, I forget the exact year, but I think it was the 1960s, where the National Educational Association said, hey, one of your best predictors of a child having an early learning disorder isn't in fact struggling with math or reading. If they're struggling with attention in your class, you might wanna pay attention to maybe they have a learning disability. And of course, any other types of mental health related factors, anxiety, depression, bipolar, um, psychosis, uh, substance abuse issues um, are all gonna come into motion that could be easily misdiagnosed for ADHD when we miss the actual underlying etiology for what this condition is. <clears throat> in late teens, uh, typically speaking, concerns are gonna start to arise because they might get a job, they might get fired, their grades might start going down. Those exact same things are gonna happen in our college environment. If uh, we have adults who, again, were intellectually capable and engaged enough in their degrees, that might not show up as symptoms until they get into their career their friends start to realize like, man, they're always one who's late. They're always ones I have to text. They're always ones like, yeah, let's just go. They'll figure out where we're at. Um, and so they start to get that reputation. Um, and again, that's true for all adults too, who might not be diagnosed, but you know, we do, get, I think my oldest person that I had come in was an 89 year old. 
who finally said, after all these years, I decided to come in because I want to know before I pass away. People tease me my whole life and I could never get where I wanted to go. It's like, so maybe I do have ADHD. Um, hard to figure out a diagnosis at 89 when you have other factors coming into motion then. Um, but some people do carry on and are able to make it through life pretty well. Um, parents prompting, teachers prompting, there's that attribution of lack of responsibility, lack of motivation, they really don't care. Uh, maybe this isn't the right time, um, but that could be uh, signs that there might be something more going on. Uh, remember these kids, because they're struggling a little bit, usually, sometimes they're just risk-taking, much higher risk for substance use related factors, high risk behaviors, their car accidents, their STDs, their pregnancy, um, it's great for parents because this means your insurance rates might get to go up, not because they were diagnosed with ADHD, but it's after they have their tickets or their accidents, which we all like. And of course, uh, I have worked with individuals historically. Um, who, I mean, they get a speeding ticket or two a year. And I'm like, man, I couldn't pay your monthly insurance rate. It's just astronomical. Um, but, you know, I'm fine. It's not a big deal. I don't want to take a medication. And I'm not a big med friendly, med savvy person in terms of wanting people to be on meds. But sometimes when these things keep beating you over the head, we do have to look at those options to say, this might be the better alternative than trying some of these other things until you learn or until you mature the maturational aspects or until you have compensations and accommodations to make this stuff more effective for you. I do want to emphasize this. ADHD, and it's not always ADHD. Um, ADHD is not permission to play video games all hours. That, one, that's not ADHD. And it doesn't mean that you just need to do what's fun for you. So we see Bill and Ted there. I can't necessarily do it all the time. It's not a reason to party and to write things off to poor effort because I have ADHD. It's not a reason to try to illegally obtain a pill um, in psychostimulants in college use and adults for that matter are exceedingly high because if I have a, a, a big task that I need to get done, a project, if I have a test coming up, man, if I could just get a couple Adderall, I'm going to be good. Um, it's not a way to counterbalance other negatively influential habits to say, well, okay, so I'm drinking, but if I take that psych stimulant because I'm ADHD. No, we can't use excuses per se. ADHD when managed effectively, and most people can be managed effectively. Some really struggle, but most can be. ADHD isn't a, a reason to check out, and it's none of those reasons to be diagnosed. I have a lot of college kids that come in on a routine basis, like, you know, I was living at home and everything was fine. Now I'm using pot daily and I'm drinking, you know, a couple of benches uh, a month with different parties. And I think I have ADHD now. And my response to them is like, it's going to be really hard for me to tell the difference between those two. Are you willing to stop using marijuana or stop your binge alcohol enough so I can get the image of you as to whether or not it's a substance abuse related factor or an ADHD factor? And like, nah, I'm not really willing to give up my marijuana. It's like, then it's going to, you know, I, I really don't know if this is going to be the most beneficial for you because marijuana can mimic ADHD like symptoms or, you know, your alcohol change and in, in, in how you're functioning could cause other problems that really won't give me the best indication of what's going on with you. Um, so we can't use an excuse and we can't use these other things to say that's why I have ADHD. So it's both ways on that one. But let's say it is ADHD or maybe not, but let's pretend it is. First things first. We're going to encourage the individual, hey, have a conversation with your physician. Psychologists, neuropsychologists are not allowed to prescribe in Michigan. Um, and so that's really not an option. Then consider therapy. You're at higher risk for anxiety and depression. You're at higher risk uh, for increasing suicidal ideation if things are not going well for you. You haven't learned, you know, you're now college, you're an adult. You haven't learned the functional skills that you might need in order to kind of work through this a little bit. So you might need some uh, mentoring. You might need some executive functioning coaching. Uh, you, you may need to um, get supports that you previously wouldn't have had. And of course, be comfortable with asking for help. Make sure you get tested because we want to make sure that is in fact ADHD. Um, roughly half of the individuals that will come in for ADHD testing, it's not ADHD. And in fact, our attention, I just had a case this morning and I'll do feedback on it this afternoon already. The attention is actually perfect. But when we look at the individual's anxiety, whew, there's a ton of anxiety, a lot of social tension, a lot of feeling out of place, a lot of comparing themselves to other performance, and that's exhausting. And so as a result, they are daydreaming, they are giving themselves those negative messages. Um, but their attention profile, everything was at least average to superior. But we had vulnerabilities in other areas. So it's not always ADHD. 
sometimes if the question is being asked, it will be. Other times, there's other etiologies, other reasons for why you might have an attention problem. Nearly any life factor or medical factor or vulnerability that we have will cause an attention problem. The importance for us is to determine what is ADHD and what might be an other etiology because we want to target treatment as accurately as possible. When we're looking at interventions, medication trials tend to be the most common because they're the fastest to get in trial. Psychostimulant, you take it, you'll know the response. It might not be the true response or the broader response that you might have at some point in time, but you'll know, is this working and helping me with my attention or not? You might need to increase the dose a little bit. You might need to chase that uh, depending on your size, weight, and metabolization factors, but that usually is like the quickest pass. EF training, counseling, health factors. Uh, there's so many great articles out there. You know, adding a half an hour of sleep for individuals who have ADHD can foundationally help a lot of their memory and recall for the next, from the previous day to the next day. Um, decreasing your simple sugar and carbohydrate intake and go more with your proteins and your fruits and vegetables and stuff. Um, more easily metabolized proteins holding the system longer they give you more potential over time. Exercise gives you adrenaline in your physiological system. We know that adrenaline noradrenergic response is important for us to facilitate what the dopa to the dopamine will eventually need. So healthy exercise routines. I know a lot of ADHD individuals get on a schedule. They try and they try, but they can't. But it takes a while to get habits and they need mentoring in how to do that. Accountability supports, friends, study groups, student support centers and different things like that. And then try to, if you start the blame game, it's my ADHD. Well, at that point in time, your motivation is actually already down. And so even if they have ADHD, we can say, hey, that might be a symptom, but the good news is, is you can actually get around that. So if you wanna blame it, you might not be going anywhere, but if you're willing to work on it, this can get better. Schools, universities, obviously, we have the uh, 504 plan that can come into play. Um, some programs in universities, I believe GRCC is one of those, they have study skills uh, trainings and workshops and stuff to try to help facilitate that knowledge that they may not have had before. Some faculty members are phenomenal at setting things up in their blackboards and setting things up, uh, whether you use Blackboard or Moodle or uh, the college platform that you're using. Uh, adults, my family uses Cozy, but there's Google and Gmail calendars that you can share together. Um, and we can use those in the college environment too, to kind of help monitor what's going on. And then a lot of individuals with ADHD tend to forget that the program is invested in them as much as they are invested in the program. Now, they're gonna struggle a little bit with the stick to but the program wants to keep them and to see them become successful. And it's important to emphasize that message because they might start to see themselves as, well, you just want my money. I'm just another th person who's paying for you. So you don't have to fire people. And once we get to that negativity, now we might have a comorbid depression or something setting in as well that may also need to be addressed. Then some study ideas. These are common um, that I put in a lot of my uh, student support recommendations for individuals, but and I'm sure most of you are familiar with those, but trying to reduce your distractions, getting extra time, getting copies and notes, study guides for quizzes and stuff. We wanna help facilitate success, definitely not facilitate disability, but definitely kind of say, you got this and we're willing to work with you. And then there's some really good educational links that come alongside there too, um, to kind of say, here's what you can do. Here's some routine accommodations that most colleges are gonna uh, look at, not all, but most, and how do we move through that process? And then that's just how to connect with brains a little bit. We have lots of options uh, to connect with us. Um, some of them I still don't know how to use, but um, our support staff are really good on those. And that's just a little bit who we are. So I have a few minutes left here before I have to uh, jump off so my staff can uh, get into the system to do their session with a, a client since we share a a Zoom here. A any other questions that people want to jump in on or any uh, other things that uh, you want to point out? Other, uh, I, I apologize that my video didn't work. And you can go ahead and jump in there uh, verbally or... Oh. Hey, I have a question for you. You, can, can, you had a slide that said um, that ADHD students graduated college at year four at about 5% and non-ADH students graduate about 33% at year four. The numbers may not may in fact be 
the same if you looked at year five and year six, but we rarely look at a college education now at the baccalaureate level at four years. So for instance, while you were talking, I looked at educationdata.org and the graduation rates went from 33%, like you cited, doubled up to 59.9% almost uh, at year five. Yeah. So it'd be interesting because you'd expect that maybe an ADHD student would take a little longer to get through college, but 5% versus 33 looks pretty bleak at year four. We might want to look at year five and year six to see if they increase. Yeah. And, and I can almost guarantee you that they do. Um, the difference being um, is a lot of the financial aspects of college, right? So depending on where you're, you're enrolled, if you're, you know, year four and you're now, you know, 50 to a hundred thousand dollars in, another year might cost you another 20 or $30,000, depending on that institution. And sometimes that might be that factor to go, I, I just can't keep doing this. I would think in similar to your point, um, if you've already committed four years, you're gonna spend that extra little bit to get your fifth year done. Um, if you're four years uh, committed, you're, you're pretty much pot committed at that point in time using Texas Hold'em, right? Um, and to my knowledge, I did not see research comparing um, ADHD individuals at year five and six in comparison to the normal graduation rate. I did look for that, but I didn't see it. CAPEX hadn't published it either. So great question and another way to probe the, the data at some point in time.